Homo sapiens, Parmen here. Welcome to the second episode of Parse This Paper with Parmen. In this series, I pick an interesting paper, give some background info on the topic or topics covered, and then go through some of the interesting points in the paper itself. Now, this episode is a very special one because it's in celebration of me being the high school science correspondent for ISSCR 2021. For those of you who don't know, the International Society for Stem Cell Research is an awesome society with the mission to promote excellence in stem cell research and applications in human health. On to what you're here for. Today's paper is titled The Organoid Platform, Promises and Challenges as Tools in the Fight Against COVID. This is by M.H. Gertz, J. Vandervart, J. Bomer, and H. Clavers. I'm sorry if I mispronounced any of those names. Now, as always, you can check out the link to the paper in the description box down below, and it's from the journal Stem Cell Reports. And so it's open access, meaning you can read all of it in full, so make sure to check it out. Now, the very first question that obviously comes to mind is, what the heck is an organoid? The paper concisely states that organoids are 3D structures grown from stem cells and consist of organ-specific cell types that self-organize through cell sorting and spatially restricted lineage commitment. Before you get intimidated and, and click away, don't worry, we'll break all of this down together. So there are 3D structures. That part makes sense. Instead of being like this flat sheet of paper, they're like this skillfully made cube. Then it says that organoids are made from stem cells. Now, if you're new to the channel or just don't know me, I need to tell you a secret. I find stem cells fascinating. I just think they're so amazing in what they can do. But as not to bore people who already know, I'm gonna give a super basic definition. And if you're interested in learning more about them, you can watch my intro to stem cells in six minutes right up there. Essentially, cells only need to fulfill two criteria to be considered stem cells. First up, they need to be able to self-renew, meaning they can make copies of themselves. Think of this aspect of stem cells like those huge printers you'll find at FedEx or Staples that just keep making copies. But stem cells don't just do that. The second thing they have to be able to do is differentiate. This is where they become more specialized. Remember when you were a kid and you were thinking of becoming an astronaut, a painter, and a superhero all at once? Well, that's what stem cells are like initially, but just like how you slowly narrow down your options, when stem cells differentiate, they become more specialized in terms of the different cell types they can become, like becoming an expressionist painter instead of just becoming an artist. There are quite a few different types of stem cells, but for our purposes, let's just focus on pluripotent stem cells and adult stem cells. Pluripotent stem cells, or PSCs for short, can become any cell in the body, like when you were a child trying to decide what professional path to go down. You may have heard of embryonic stem cells, for example. These are examples of PSCs. They can give rise to any cell in the adult human body. In contrast, adult stem cells are restricted to a specific cell or tissue type, like you as a teenager with fewer career options, but still not just one. For example, if you decided to go to art school but didn't yet know that you wanted to focus on expressionism. Some examples of adult stem cells include gut and skin stem cells. The lining of our guts and our skin cells need to be replenished constantly, and this is all possible thanks to our wonderful stem cells. Pretty amazingly, scientists have figured out a way to take differentiated cells and turn them back into pluripotent stem cells. This is like someone opening themselves back up to the possibility of any profession. Now, these stem cells are fittingly called induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs for short. Organoids can be made from both pluripotent and adult stem cells. Now hang on tight to your seats, because we're on to the last part of the organoid definition. It says that the cells can self-organize. This means the scientists don't need to tell the cells where to go or how to create the organoid. The cells do that on their own, mimicking normal development when in the right conditions. While the processes are completely different biologically, it may help to think of this as a flower. You don't need to tell a flower how to grow as long as it's provided with sunlight and water. Awesome, right? Now, organoids sure sound like an amazing feat of science, but is there really a need for them? 
there certainly is. And let's take a look at a few reasons why. One of our current methods for studying human tissues involves using uniform cell lines, a single type of cell that we can maintain in a lab. The problem is that our bodies aren't made up of just one type of cell. If they were, we'd be blobs, not amazingly complex and intelligent organisms. Organoids to the rescue. Certain types of organoids contain multiple different cell types, and this makes scientists' research in a lab much more realistic. Another shortcoming of traditional methods comes down to treatment efficacy. That's how effective a treatment is in real life. Just like how sometimes you perform worse on a test than anticipated, quite often clinical efficacy, that's how effective a treatment is in a lab, doesn't match up with the efficacy in real humans. Right now, organoids seem to be a really promising tool in helping minimize this gap, so there are no surprises when a drug first enters a real human body. Now that that's out of the way, how are organoids made exactly? Let's take a trip to the lab to understand. The starting point for an organoid can either be pluripotent or adult stem cells. For example, in your gut, you have stem cells which divide every few days. These are responsible for replenishing your gut, which has very rapid turnover. Scientists found that they could isolate these adult stem cells, and under the right conditions, they could grow a mini version of a gut in the lab. This is an organoid. But these organoids won't have nerves, blood vessels, or immune cells unless they're added separately to the model. Scientists are currently working on making organoid models that more closely represent our multicellular organs. Putting together everything we've learned about stem cells, what organoids are, and how they're made together, let's take a look at a real example of the power of organoids. As you probably know, we use animal models, like for example mice models, for studying a lot of brain diseases. Something you may not know is that a lot of the times these models just aren't sufficient enough for human diseases. It makes sense. Humans are humans and mice are mice. For example, certain areas in the human brain, like the cerebral cortex, just have certain features that don't exist in mice. And this was a bit of a problem when trying to understand the answer to an important question during the height of the Zika pandemic. Why does the Zika virus affect fetal brains so much more severely compared to those post-birth? What they couldn't understand using traditional methods like animal models was about to be understood using cerebral organoids, the fancy word for brain organoids. They found that the virus selectively divided in neural progenitor cells, brain cells that can differentiate into more specialized brain cells but can't divide indefinitely, unlike stem cells. There's definitely some debate around how much of this neuronal division happens in adults, but one thing's for sure, it happens much more often during fetal development. So you have a bunch of these cells dividing with the virus in them in the fetal brain, while it happens much less frequently in adults. It's definitely scary to think about, but important to know. Now, while this example is really interesting, we can take a look at something much more current, something we've unfortunately all had to deal with over the past year. I'm talking about COVID-19, of course. Scientists are using organoids to study models of SARS-CoV-2, the evil little virus behind COVID-19, to better understand how it infects tissues and to uncover new treatments. Before we look to the future, though, let's take a look at the not-so-distant past, back when we knew even less about SARS-CoV-2. I'm gonna tell you something crazy, so brace yourself. SARS-CoV-2 was first discovered using air-liquid interface, or ALI models, a type of organoid. Scientists were able to notice some cell death using human airway epithelium in ALI culture, and then using microscopy, they were able to find the virus itself. Is that mind-blowing or what? Another group used organoids to show how the infection affected the gastrointestinal system. At the beginning of the pandemic, we thought COVID only affected the respiratory system, but we now know that's not true. In some cases, patients experience vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Now, while it may seem like a no-brainer at this point, we need to find out whether the cells were directly getting infected, and it turns out that that was the case. This finding makes it easier to create treatments that target the specific symptoms we're looking at because we know exactly how the cells are being affected. 
Now, this brings me to another advantage of organoids, how they let us study specific tissues in detail. If you remember back from middle school, we want to minimize the number of variables at work so we can look at the one that we're interested in in more detail. Organoids let us do just that. So organoids have taught us quite a bit about COVID. Cool, but how about how to treat it? That too. Organoids are being used for drug discovery as we speak. For example, when organoids were infected with SARS-CoV-2, the organoids released an enzyme called cholesterol 25-hydroxylase. 25-hydroxylase then produced 25-hydroxycholesterol. Yay, confusingly similar names. 25-hydroxycholesterol, or 25-HC for short, is helpful in slowing the replication of the virus. When lung organoids were treated with 25-HC, they saw that SARS-CoV-2 replication was lessened. After this discovery, one group used 25-HC nanovesicles and saw a decrease in the number of cytokine storms. That's when the body starts to attack its own cells in an attempt to fight off infection. Nanovesicles are just small sacs that are used for chemical messaging in the body. In this case, they're used to deliver the 25-HC. Now let's take a look at a non-virology example, where organoids have been used to successfully model diseases and identify new treatments, cystic fibrosis. Our bodies are constantly moving mucus in our lungs, gut, and liver. While you might be grossed out by that, our lives literally depend on it. If this doesn't happen, then the epithelial cells that line our respiratory and digestive systems would lose a layer of protection, making them more prone to pathogens. In cystic fibrosis, or CF for short, mutations in just one gene prevent proper clearance of mucus in the lungs, leading to chronic inflammation. While treatments exist for about half of CF patients, there are over 2,000 different variations of CF, and these drugs don't work for every type of the disease. So researchers are taking cells from the patient, then turning those into the induced pluripotent stem cells I mentioned earlier, and using those to create organoids. Now they have a model of the patient's specific disease, and they can use that to test different treatments and see what the patient will respond to. Now that we've talked plenty about the amazing things organoids can do, it's only fair that I bring up the challenges too. Most of the experiments and studies I've been talking about don't include key immune cells like B and T cells, which are involved in fighting off viral infections. As you might imagine, that is pretty important when it comes to studying COVID-19. But organoids may once again provide a solution. Cells can be co-cultured in organoids, meaning cultured together, but this needs to become commonplace in order to solve the problem. And when it comes down to it, organoids are still a model in a dish, and so it's hard to replicate all aspects of a complex human being. Another problem comes along when we consider drug screening, a promising aspect of organoids that I touched on before. The fastest way to test drugs is using high-throughput screening, where robots are used to test a large number of drugs or compounds. And yes, that is as cool as it sounds. Let's just hope the robots don't turn on us. When using dangerous pathogens like SARS-CoV-2, there are obvious safety risks with this fast-paced screening, and so a recent study used pseudoviruses instead. The cool thing about pseudoviruses is that they don't replicate, lowering the hazard of handling them. But this only allowed for medium throughput screening, which is slower, and pseudoviruses can only mimic real viruses so well. On top of that, drug screening with organoids is biased right now. Screens currently use certain factors like morphology, which includes things like the size, shape, and form of the cell, but morphology sometimes isn't a good indicator of how the cells are reacting to the drug. Regardless of these challenges, organoids hold so much promise and have already helped us achieve a lot. From screening drugs to genetic testing to better understanding epithelial responses, the world should be ready for an organoid takeover. If you want to learn more about stem cells, organoids, and the current state of stem cell treatments, check out closer look at stemcells.org and check out all of my references and credits down below in the description box. See you next time!